everyone and welcome to this taster session for our QCG BF Spring School in Monetary and Financial Policy Analysis. My name is Lucky Singh and I'm the Client Relationship Manager here at King's Business School um, and I work in our executive education team and help prospective participants find out a little bit more about our programs and ultimately help them through the application process. Um, I work specifically on the QCGBF Spring School. So um, if you are interested in this program and will be applying, then you'll be speaking to me um, and I'll be more than happy to help. Joining me today is um, our professor, David Eichmann, who is a professor of finance, finance and the director of the QCGBF um, School. Um, and he also um, is here at King's Business School. So the agenda for today is um, I'm going to be handing over to David to tell you a bit more about um, what QCGBF is and what they do over there. Um, and then he'll also take you through um, uh, an introduction into the course, tell you a bit more about who it's for um, and give you information about the course format, the course content, our learning objectives. And then we'll be having a Q&A session at the end uh, where you can ask us any of your questions. Um, so feel free to, to send us your questions and we can answer those at the end. OK, so I'm going to hand over to you, David. Um, please introduce yourself and over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Lucky, and hello uh, for those, and thanks for, for joining. So um, let me start with a brief introduction. So um, I joined King's in 2020 to um, head up um, the Qatar Centre for Global Banking and Finance, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a couple of minutes. Before joining King's, I was basically a career central banker. So I joined the Bank of England in 2002, having done a PhD in macroeconomics. Over my time at the bank, I did a variety of roles, but basically transitioned from the monetary policy macro side to more finance and financial stability issues, where in particular, I kind of worked on kind of building up the bank's um, macro potential policy function after the global financial crisis in 2008. Um, I also had the kind of privilege of spending some time at the, um, the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, where I worked in as, as an advisor for two years. And um, earlier in my career, I was a visiting scholar at the Bank of Japan. So I'm, I feel I'm kind of someone steeped in central banking who's kind of recently moved to, to academia. Lucky, if you could move to the slide, um, maybe it's two slides forward, and I'll say something about the Qatar Center. So just so the center itself, um, we're basically a research center focused on central banking and the challenges that central banks face in today's global economy. That's the kind of tagline. That's quite a broad set of issues. So in terms of our kind of research strategy itself, we focus on like three aspects of these challenges that we think central banks are kind of confronting at the moment. The first one is around the objectives and mandates that we give to central banks and the policy frameworks that they use to pursue those, those mandates. So monetary policy frameworks, financial stability frameworks in particular. The second one is around key structural changes that are happening in the economy and in the and the financial system, particularly those associated with climate change and innovation in the financial system, um, financial technology. And thirdly, um, the business school here at King's, we have a really a wealth of expertise in data science and applied econometrics. So the strategy really is to try and kind of use that as a as a as a guiding approach through which to um, to shed light on the the, the you know the, the aforementioned issues. So that's a kind of a word about this the center. That's a kind of a segue really to allow me to introduce this course to you all. So I'll kind of start with the observation that in my lifetime, I think this is the kind of most profound set of changes um, that I think have happened in the, you know, in the global economy and the financial system, really for kind of many, many decades, I think. Um, we, of course, have the kind of immediate challenges of managing the pandemic and the kind of latest twists and turns it's taking and then the eventual 
exit from these emergency packages that central banks have put in place. So this is obviously a pressing issue. But at the same time as this, we have like a series or a set of um, deep structural changes that are happening in the economy and the financial system. And I think these are things that will affect um, our lives and the, you know, the issues that central banks have to confront for kind of many, many years um, it going, going forwards. So one of these is, I would say, just to pick out a couple, one is climate change and the implications for our economies of transitioning to a net zero carbon economy. What's this going to mean for the financial system? And the second one is this kind of set of um, really rapid innovations we're seeing in the use of financial technology, disintermediation of the banking system, interest in new forms of digital money, digital currencies. And alongside this, this is still kind of vague notion of decentralized finance or DeFi and what this will mean for, um, for central banks. So, so the picture I'm trying to paint is one of where we have this kind of deep structural changes happening. And I, I think our view really is that central banks need to be cognizant of these changes. They need to understand the kind of risks and opportunities um, that they, you know, these changes will bring with them. And it's really with this in mind that we've created this, uh, what we're calling a spring school in monetary and financial policy analysis. It's kind of designed to give current central bankers and financial regulators or those with an interest in those issues um, an introduction really to the, the skills and knowledge that they require to tackle these changes. So the format of the course, um, what we have in mind is a five-day course that will be held in person at our central London campus, which is kind of right in the middle of, of London in the Strand. So it's kind of equidistant between the city of London, the financial capital, and the political capital in Westminster. So it's a fabulous location. It's the first point. Um, the dates we have in mind for this are the 28th of February. So it's the week beginning the 28th of February, basically. Now, there's an asterisk on that first line, basically because we're, of course, aware that, um, you know, despite the best plans to organize this as an in-person event, um, you know, there is a chance that we'll have to move this to online, depending on how the COVID situation um, twists and turns in the coming weeks. We'll basically make a call on that um, this side of Christmas to give participants plenty of notice, um, you know, plenty of time to uh, to adjust their their diaries. And I'm happy to give a few details of it in the Q and A in terms of what that online um, version would actually look like in practice. In terms of the structure of the course, the idea is we're going to devote each day to a different topic. So this will be a broad course covering a range of issues. And it'll be kind of taught by lecturers from King's Business School, from the faculty. Um, we have a bunch of external experts, guest lecturers that we've lined up for this course. There'll be kind of hands-on discussions, kind of work, um, case studies, computer-based training, this, this type of thing. So it's certainly not going to be a course where you kind of arrive and sit down and be lectured at. This will be a very interactive um, experience. Okay, and the, I've hinted at this already, but in terms of who the target audience is for this course, I think we really have in mind... Um, people who are working in central bank, professionals working in central banks or financial regulation authorities who are involved in applied quantitative work. Okay, so we're happy to kind of discuss that with you individually in terms of what that means for you. But that's that's the type of, um, and I'll, you'll see this in the kind of taster I'm going to give you in a second. That's the type of cohort we have in mind. I think this will also be of interest to doctoral students in econ finance or related fields who are interested in pursuing a career in central banking at some point down the road. Um, I, I think some previous training in economics and finance and econometrics is going to be kind of essential to the course. Again, I'm 
it might be easiest to kind of discuss on a bilateral basis exactly what that looks like for you or your staff who are interested in pursuing this. All right, so let me kind of get down a little bit into the, the details of this to give you a, a slightly more, um, uh, a, a better description of what this is going to look like. So this is, again, assuming we can do this in person. So I've kind of sketched it in terms of a, you know, a week long course. Um, you know, it'll have the same structure if this is online anyway. But well, basically, as you know, as this table is illustrating, devotes a different day to, to a different topic. So each day will cover a different topic, ranging from monetary policy, macro prudential and financial stability policy. I think of these as like the cornerstones of central banking in many ways. Then transitioning into kind of newer, hotter topics right now. So data analytics, we'll have a day on that, climate finance, and fintech and digital currencies. Um, we've got a series of really distinguished um, course leads for, you know, who kind of cover each one of these topics and give like an introductory lecture each day on each of these topics. So Reese, Dr. Reese Bidder and myself, we're the directors of the Qatar Center and um, uh, we'll cover the first two days. We then have Professor George Capitanios, who's a kind of world-renowned expert in, in econometrics and data science. Professor Paul Gast is leading our, the business school's work on ESG. And Michael Schillig um, is a professor from the law school who, who's an expert on kind of decentralized finance, digital currencies, and will give us that perspective. And then we have, as you can see in the final column, a range of, I think, really exciting and interesting um, guest speakers ranging from Professor Martin Wheel, who is a former member of the bank's monetary policy committee. Um, Nikki Anderson is a someone uh, with deep expertise in financial stability, who's currently still at the Bank of England. Richard Barwell um, is a macroeconomist working for BNP Paribas. Um, and Tony Yates is someone who I, I suspect many of you might know from his, uh, well, he's a very kind of vocal commentator on policy issues um, and a very thoughtful individual. We'll be looking to build out that guest speaker um, set even further before the course, I should also say. All right, so let me kind of um, give you a little bit more of a taster in terms of the types of questions that I expect us to kind of focus on throughout these, um, throughout the course. And I think before I kind of dive into this, I'll just say a general approach will be to kind of focus on the kind of most pressing, important policy questions that central banks are confronting at the moment. And you'll see this in my slides. And the approach will basically be to give you a blend of, you know, what's the nature of that policy debate, but then also what is there in the kind of cutting edge research that's been been produced in recent years, both in academia and in central banking, what can that add to these these um, these policy challenges? How can we kind of inf have a, an informed um, view about how central banks should tackle these these issues? So let me turn to uh, I'll, I'll pick up four of these as because as an illustration of the types of issues I think we'll we'll focus on. So the first one is a monetary policy topic. And you know, there are many issues currently in terms of pressing issues for monetary policymakers to concern themselves with. One, I think, is the kind of observation that natural rates of interest, our star, if, you, if you're familiar with that language, has kind of been falling in many countries around the world for decades, really. And we've ended up in a situation where policy rates around most of the world are kind of either at zero or very close to zero. And that obviously poses challenges to central banks in terms of using those policy rates as the kind of main instruments for, for influencing economic activity and inflation. So we've seen innovations by central banks in terms of moving to, you know, some cases pushing policy rates into negative territory. The chart on the left 
shows you a time series of policy rates in a bunch of countries, where particularly in Europe, we've seen a number of countries actually implement negative interest rates, which is still quite a striking idea. Alongside that, we've seen other innovations like forward guidance, central banks um, trying to influence a range of yields through quantitative easing programs and so on. So I think one question is, what have we learned about the effectiveness of these, these different unconventional monetary policies? And you know, how should those lessons be cemented kind of going forwards in terms of the policy framework central banks use? And another one is, you know, the chart on the right that shows you a time series of the Bank of England's balance sheet, so its asset holdings, if you like, relative to GDP, going back several centuries. And you can see that kind of one of the implications of these unconventional policies is the size of the balance sheet has absolutely kind of ballooned since, really since 2008, to unprecedented levels. And that raises questions about, you know, how should this be unwound going forwards? And what's kind of a, an appropriate st steady state balance sheet size and balance sheet management strategy for, for central banks? So these are kind of quite profound questions, I think. Lucky, brilliant, thank you. So the, so the next one I'll highlight, uh, this time it's a financial stability topic. And, I'll start with a kind of observation, really, that for monetary policymakers, we're quite, we're quite used to them having a quantitative target to guide their decisions, their policy actions. And it's usually expressed in terms of a 2% inflation target or something like that. We don't have that for financial stability. So the objectives we give to these authorities that are pursuing financial stability policies is a much vaguer they're typically expressed in terms of making the financial system resilient. And you know, when we're thinking about what these objectives should really look like, I sometimes like to separate or distinguish between, so for a monetary policymaker, it's, it's really about the kind of central outlook for the economy. What I mean by that is, you know, you can think of their job as trying to make sure that the mean or even modal forecast for inflation two years ahead is like in line with the, the target set by the governments. You know, that's one description of what monetary policy is there to do. For financial stability, it's much more about the tail risks that the economy um, can face going forward. So it's not the most likely course for the economy. It's what risks are brewing is the question. But I think with that in mind, like one of the most, I think, important developments we've seen in recent years has been the introduction of a concept that's called growth at risk or GDP at risk. This is, goes back a few years, actually, but it was popularized by a paper by Tobias Adrian and colleagues at the New York Fed, since been pushed very hard by the IMF as a kind of a quantitative a way of kind of expressing financial stability goals in more quantitative terms. And in particular, it's, a, it's trying to quantify the contribution that the financial system and the vulnerabilities that are building up in the financial system are making to, um, to tail risk in the economy. And this um, incredible chart you can see on the slide here is taken from Tobias Adrian's paper, and it's a time series of forecasts of of tail risk in the economy and how it's kind of ebbing and flowing um, depending on the state of the financial system. So this is another thing we'll get into. A third, so changing gear a little bit, this time I'm going to talk about digital currencies. And here we're seeing, you know, again, really radical um, proposals being put forward in terms of how central banks should be providing currency to citizens. Um, and in particular, whether there should be a central bank digital currency that's not just provided to banks, which we kind of have that at the moment in the form of bank reserves, but provided to everyone in the economy. So you and I could hold a deposit account with the central bank. The chart on this slide is taken from a recent paper by the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements. And it gives you like a schematic visualization of you know, what um, a CBDC, central bank digital currency, would, would mean in practice. And it would be a direct claim from retail customers 
um, on the central bank in the same way that cash, you know, coins and banknotes are uh, at the moment. This raises kind of really quite profound questions like, firstly, you know, should central banks be offering deposit and lending facilities to kind of everyone in the economy, or should their role be much more curtailed and narrow? Another one is, you know, what would the introduction of a central bank digital currency, what would it mean for the existing banking system? There are concerns that it could basically lead to a, a squeeze on funding for, for traditional commercial banks because the deposits would flow out of you know, their own institutions and into the central bank's accounts. And that could have implications for lending in the economy. So really, you know, profound changes being considered in this area um, and interesting research emerging, I would say. And then the last one, I'll highlight, so this is climate change. And so the charts on the left, some of you may have seen previously, but central banks are kind of engaged in efforts to try and stress test their financial systems for different climate scenarios at the moment. And those, the charts on the left basically gives you a very stylized um, overview of what these scenarios look like. So on the vertical axis, we have the kind of emissions of the economy, carbon emissions. And you can see the kind of dotted, is that a blue line or a gray line, um, no transition. You know, this is the kind of path we're kind of effectively currently on, notwithstanding the, the recent COP um, summit in Glasgow. And the other paths are kind of some alternative um, trajectories for how we could wind down emissions so the you know the good line here is the green one where there's an orderly transition starting more or less immediately and there's a gradual reduction in emissions and you can see the the others have this kind of steeper slope so they're more of a kind of um, a delayed recognition of the scale of the problem and then a need to slam on the brakes and really um bring emissions down very rapidly. So the question is, you know, what would that mean for banks and insurance companies and other parts of the financial system if we were to pursue some of these different um, scenarios? And the chart on the right is taken from a, I'd almost call it like a pilot stress test that the European Central Bank conducted this year. And it's showing you their calculations for what this what these scenarios would mean for GDP in the euro area um, and and actually other countries as well. So there's a lot of activity in this space about trying to understand the implications of climate change for our economies and for the financial system. And then more broadly, what role should central banks play in this in this transition? Okay, so that's kind of four, you know, that I've gone into a little bit more detail, four questions I've gone into a little bit more detail about, just to kind of flag to you some others, because, you know, this, there's just so much going on of interest right now. So we have, I would expect the course will also cover questions about, you'll have seen a lot of central banks have been reviewing their policy frameworks for monetary policy in the last couple of years. The Fed in particular have moved to what they call a flexible average inflation targeting Framework, so we'll be looking at what that actually means in practice for stabilization policy. I think there are questions about, you know, the reforms that we put in place after the global financial crisis ten years or so ago. You know, how well are they actually working in practice? Um, you know, what are the new areas of reform that are required? I think that'll also be an interesting topic for us to discuss. I, I think questions around communication of central bank policy are becoming increasingly important and what the kind of most effective strategies for communication will be. And we'll be trying to get some direct practical insights from people involved with this, it, you know, working in some, you know, on this question of communication in the course. And then lastly, I mentioned this already in an earlier slide, but we're seeing these kind of quite fundamental developments happening in decentralized finance or DeFi. And, you know, I think another topic for the course is, you know, what do regulators actually need to know about this? So that gives you hopefully a little glimpse into the 
um, the substance of what this will actually involve. In terms of what participants will gain from attending this, I'll pick out kind of three, three highlights. The first really, I mean, is the obvious one. It's a chance to kind of develop some new practical skills. That's, of course, why you come on a course of this type. You know, I would, I'd say they are skills both in terms of understanding a kind of a you know, new subject matter that's going to become increasingly important for, for your roles, but also new, new practical skills in terms of applying new kind of data analytics, applied econometrics approaches. So there will be that element to this course. Of course, there's a limit to how much you can get into this in a five-day course, but you'll have some exposure to these new, um, new techniques that are being developed. The second thing I'd point out or pick out is really the guest speakers we're lining up for this are really, really experts in their fields. So you'll get the chance to interact with, I'd say, thought leaders who can give you a real world perspective on these, these various challenges we'll be discussing. So I think there'll be a really valuable part of this, this approach, uh, this course. And lastly, you know, last but not least, I should certainly say, and this really something I've found myself in terms of going on similar courses in the past. It's, it's really the networking opportunities they provide that's very valuable. You'll have a, you'll be mixing with a cohort of attendees from around the world. And I think I'd expect this to give you a, you know, a set of people that you can interact with for many years ahead, like-minded people, if, if that makes sense. So that's really something we're looking to, to build as part of this. <laughs> And then my final slide, just some learning objectives from the course itself. So I would say I'll pick up four things. So one is really to develop a deeper understanding of the key models that are used by leading central banks to inform their monetary policy and their financial stability policy decisions. And you'll have a chance to apply these models in practice so you can see how they can actually be used um, in, you know, in anger. The second thing I'd point out is you'll have a chance to understand the latest developments in the policy frameworks that underpin central banks, monetary policy, and financial stability decisions. And I'd expect the course to give you, a, you know, the ability to kind of critically assess both the strengths and the weaknesses of these frameworks. So coming back to the Fed's move to an average inflation targeting framework, you know, why have they done that? What are the what are the strengths of that move, and you know where is it potentially weak? Third thing I'd point out is you'll have a you'll get an introductory understanding of key innovations in climate finance and in fintech, which are areas which I would argue are kind of of rapidly growing interest for central banks. Then lastly, it's again an introductory understanding of important new tools that are shaping this discipline in the area of data science, data analytics. We have a real depth of expertise in this area in the business school. We, you know, harnessing as part of the delivery of this of this course. Okay, that's all from me. I'll hand back to Lucky. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, David. Um, that was incredibly informative. And um, yeah, I feel like there's some really exciting and interesting topics um, that you mentioned. So I'd like to launch into our Q&A session. So just give me a second and I'll stop sharing the slides. So if you have any questions, please do pop it into the um, Q&A chat. Um, I do not see any. So um, I know that we wanted to speak about a couple of things, David, that you mentioned. Um, and first of all, um, I think it will be on a lot of people's minds is what would the online version of this program look like if, you know, we do have to switch to that. Yeah, thanks, Lucky. So I, I think, you know, while we're recording this, it's kind of, you know, there has been some news in recent days about the, you know, the spread of this, this new Omicron variant of the virus. And we're obviously watching this very carefully in terms of what it means for for, a, for an in-person course delivered in March. Um, so firstly, I'd say we have a, a lot of expertise and experience now in delivering online courses. So there won't be any implications of moving online in terms of the kind of quality of the, the experience that attendees 
um, have from attending the course. The basic idea we have in terms of structure is instead of trying to cram this into a week, what we do is we would pick a day on each week. So I think this a Tuesday is some, something that normally works well. And we'd devote something like a three hour slot um, on Tuesdays in kind of consecutive weeks to deliver one topic of the course. So we'd do the monetary policy module to begin with, and a week later we'd do the financial stability module and so on. I think that would allow, you know, it has some benefits moving to that, that structure because it would allow us to kind of pose some exercises to participants. It will also allow you to do this while you're in your current job. You won't need to take a week out. Um, and, you know, I am very conscious that, you know, part of this course should be about kind of getting a cohort of people together to, you know, experience this in person and, uh, you know, have developed those contacts. So I think what we'll end up doing is we'll be running a conference, um, a big international conference in July, by which time, hopefully, you know, we'll be over any uh, it'll be clearer that an in-person event will be feasible and possible. Um, so this will be in early July. And what I'd envisage doing is the day before the conference starts, inviting everybody who's participated in this course to um, to to an event that we'd convene at the business school. So there'll be a chance for the networking there. There may be some kind of chance for some presentations from, from attendees based on what they've learned and then you'll be able to stick around and listen to the participate in the you know the wonderful two day conference that we've got lined up afterwards. So that's the kind of that's Plan B, if you like. And we'll try and make a call on this this side of Christmas, like I like I said. Great, thank you, David. Um, and I just wanted to add um, some of the kind of benefits that our participants will get from coming onto the program. Program. So, um, as an alumni of, uh, as an alum of King's Business School, you do get a fifteen percent um, saving across all of our executive courses. Um, so, we have a leadership and people management program. Uh, we have a leading with EQ course as well. So, um, lots of different programs designed to give you those core business skills that you need to succeed. Um, and then you'll also join our network of, um, of other alumni. So we have a LinkedIn group and we host a regular amount of events. Um, and we also share um, different types of thought leadership pieces with our alumni. So, you know, you'll be part of a really, you know, connected um, and really interesting group of, of individuals that are part of the King's Business School and, and the King's College London um, network. Um, so, you know, definitely a reason to consider um, coming onto this course as well. Um, and then in terms of fees, so um, our in-person fee is um, £4,950 um, and we are ironing out, um, you know, what the virtual cost of that will be. So we, we can publish that soon. Um, but also want to say that we offer a range of savings for our alumni. So there's a 15% saving if you're a King's College alumni. And um, also we, we offer corporate savings as well. So, you know, if, if there might be some other colleagues within your organization who you think would like to come to this course, then you can speak to your to your managers and, and we do offer a corporate fee for um, companies who send more than one individual to our courses. So, um, so definitely worth considering that as well. Um, any other questions? David, anything else to add about the program? I don't think so. Just to say, very happy for people to reach out if they want to know a little bit more detail about any of the things we expect to cover. Um, I assume they can do that through contacting you, and I'd be, you know, happy to have conversations with with anyone in that regard. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just wanted to say, um, so our applications will open pretty soon, so in the next um, week or so. Um, but you can also speak to myself. Um, by emailing me at luckbear.staying at kcl.ac.uk um, and then happy to have a consultation with you to tell you a bit more about the program and, and speak to you a bit more about um, the application process. Um, and yeah, we'll be hosting a lot of different events um, on this program and also for our executive courses. So do try and come along to that. Um, and uh, we're more than happy to, to share any further information. So 
Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Um, it's been it's been great to listen to you and, and hear more about the program. Um, and thank you all for for watching and attending. Um, and yes, uh, any questions, let us know and um, have a lovely day. Thank you.